I mean, people will test this all the time. The market will effectively test this by uh, selling dollars for gold or redeeming dollars in gold. And uh, dollars get sold all the time and prices still move up and down independent of what you say that the dollar's worth. So that is one of the reasons why in the 30s, the US confiscated dollars and then revalued them because the US was basically going through a liquidity crisis in the Great Depression. But under a gold standard, your liquidity is tied to gold. If you can't find more gold, you can't find more money. If you really need more money, that is a problem. So mm -hmm. if you confiscate all the gold and then devalue it by uh, whatever number you want, I think it was like 70% or 40%, whatever, that effectively gives you 40% more money instantly mm -hmm. because you basically peg it higher. Now, if you look at how this works, you have the dollar here and the goal here. If people start selling the dollar, then the uh, value, well, we can say it goes down. But you want this line to be exactly this. So the value goes down. Now, there's only one way to keep this value from dropping, and that is you need to buy dollars. If the central bank buys dollars, it can destroy dollars. That means that there's less dollars in the market at the same supply of gold, and that means that the dollar becomes more valuable than gold. And the line starts going up again. Now, how does the central bank do this outside of foreign uh, currency? Well, you do that with gold. So effectively, when the dollar goes down, you sell more gold into the market and you buy more dollars back. And that is how you keep the peg. But if the opposite happens, if the dollar becomes worth more than gold, then you still need to do something about that because continuous deflation isn't good either. So how do you do that? Well, you start buying gold out of the market and you start printing dollars and it equalizes again. Hey everybody, it's Rob Keynes at goldsilverpros.com. We're recording part two of our conversation with Dezo this on Friday, April 29th. And uh, we wanted to talk about what had gone on recently with Russia and whether they were pegging their ruble to gold or, or what the mechanics of that were and how that may actually affect the gold market and the price of the ruble as well. And I think Deso had a big clarification from his point of view than what mm -hmm. most other people were saying, including myself. So wanted to bring him back on to talk about it. And I felt like this would be uh, in, the, in and of itself a good segment to separate out. All right, Karen, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing very well. I have a little bit of allergies, so I may sound sick. I'm mm. not. Um, <laughs> that's for, that's the reason for the raspy voice. Yeah, we had some mic trouble up front, too. Yeah, so two mics died on me this morning, but well, I had a third backup, so <laughs> we're going to see how this goes. <laughs> so if my mic is not quite attuned to the video like it normally is, if you're watching this, we'll, we'll get it sorted out, but I had to use a brand new one this morning. All right, so... Um, so I think the narrative was a couple of things happened at the same time, or a lot of things happened at the same time around what people can uh, perceived was the petrodollar. You had mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and China doing contracts for oil for yuan. You had Russia saying, okay, if you want our natural gas, you have to use rubles. And then you had what a lot of people said was, well, Russia is now pegging its ruble to gold to uh, support the ruble uh, as a floor. And you have a different perspective on that. Walk us through the Russian ruble gold piece of it and what it actually means. So um, I did quite a, I did a long video on it with uh, Ron Gavrili a while back. So I'll give the more cliff notes now since more has happened. Mm -hmm. um, this all spans back for many years and uh, we can trace what's happening now to the petrodollar and effectively ruble gold as an extension of it. Uh, back to the shale wars of 2015. Mm -hmm. So uh, while well, we can go even further back to the uh, security arrangement that the U.S. made with Saudi Arabia, where uh, Saudi Arabia would only sell its oil in dollars and they would get security guarantees from the U.S. government in mm -hmm. return. Now, that lasted for a long time, that arrangement. But when the U.S. Uh, discovered shale technology, and started to become a net energy exporter, that relationship effectively got turned upside its head 
because now America was no longer buying Saudi oil and they were effectively competing with Saudi oil, uh, being okay. a net exporter of energy. So um, no longer were any dollars flowing to the Saudis via that way. Now, the Saudis were still selling their dollars in oil, but their biggest customer now is China. Okay. And, you know, it weakens the Saudi position because at any given point, America can just say, well, we revoke these security guarantees because we don't need you anymore. We are energy independent. That provides a huge security risk for Saudi Arabia, if you look at it from their perspective. Therefore, they decided to basically go to war with America, only not with weapons, but with what they have, oil. Mm -hmm. They underestimated just how much junk debt this Federal Reserve was capable of buying before the system collapsed. We didn't see any system collapse between 2015, 2017-ish, where oil recovered, I think. Anyway, uh, basically, America won that oil war by just throwing money at shale and keeping it alive through massive amounts of junk debt. Now, when 2020 came along and the COVID pandemic happened, uh, the original plan was still to cut production. And that was, I think, in February, late February that it happened. Uh, COVID was already clearly becoming a global issue. Uh, many countries were locking down. So uh, demand for oil was very predictably going to take a nosedive. That was the time also where at the same time, Russia took revenge for America's sanctions on Russia in 2014, when the whole Ukraine business got started. Russia simply said, no, they were not going to cut production. From the moment the Russians said no, the future was guaranteed to happen in only one way, and that is a massive energy surplus. Because the oil was still going to get pumped, but it was not going to get used. And the, you know, to the normal people, they might not have noticed. But if you're the leader of a country that does a lot in oil, you immediately know what the effects of this are. So the Saudis realized that since the status quo was about to change, with cheap oil, shale will be in trouble with its high production costs. They decided to basically do the same thing again and crash the price of oil to finally finish shale off. Now, uh, as we all know, oil ended up being neg negative $37 a barrel because the Saudis, instead of announcing a production cut, announced that they were going to pump as much oil as they could. And they mm -hmm. did. So the oil price went negative because nobody had any place to put all of this oil, which mm -hmm. all seems very strange now that we have such a shortage. But in any case, it effectively worked. The rig count of uh, shale in America has been cut in half. And all the inventory that's been, all the wells that have been used in the past year to cover up the oil shortage that we have now it's mostly pre-drilled stuff. If you follow Doomberg uh, on Twitter, he's been on top of this for a while. Uh, the last time I checked, they were st still about half of what they were at the start of the pandemic. The rig count has not improved. It it's gone up a little, but it's nowhere near pre-pandemic. It's nowhere near those boom levels. And I think America right now is also a net energy importer, though I can't be sure on that. In any case, uh, well, the massive oil shortage everywhere uh, shows you what all these effects were. And at the time, it was brought as a oil war between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Shale wasn't even mentioned in the mainstream press. Which, and like, again, it's a huge error because mm -hmm. the Saudis produce at $18 a barrel. The mm -hmm. Russians at about $22 or $28 a barrel and shale at $85 a barrel. And they're just announced to pump more to drop the price. I mean, who, who do you think they're attacking here? Anyway, with all of that mess leading to, well, the various things that have happened over the past two years, now that we're effectively, uh, the West is at war with Russia, not a hot war yet, but definitely a financial war, um, Russia is basically going to the next stage here. 
they're attacking the dollar directly by simply making their own currency better. And how do you make a currency better? Well, you give it more value. How do you do that? Well, you tie it to say something you can't print like commodities. Now, uh, this is where the Petro one comes from because again, the Saudis have basically been preparing for a situation like this where China as the largest consumer would take over on the global markets from America, which is now uh, still, you know, a, a net energy export or something close. They're a net importer of crude, but net exporter of petroleum and distillates. So mm -hmm. um, that is where we ended up with the war. And there is where we got the message that Russia was going to buy gold at a set price of 5,000 rubles per gram. And that is where we start talking about ruble gold. But the, the lead up is important because it shows that this is not just Russia grasping at straws. This mm -hmm. is basically a process that has been underway for a very long time. Um, and it's going to, well, it leads to the end of the dollar as a reserve currency of the world because mm -hmm. no reserve currency of the world lasts forever. Nope. Now, where the confusion that I was wanted to talk about comes from is that when it was announced that Russia would buy gold at a set price of 5,000 rubles per gram, suddenly everyone on the internet was like, oh my God, it's a ruble backed, uh, gold backed ruble, and we're now at the gold backed currency and everything. No. No. On the one hand, it's much more genius than that. On the other hand, it's not yet that dangerous. So you have to look at what a gold peg really is. So we remember the gold standard, like the time mm -hmm. where the dollar was backed by like 35, well, $35 per ounce of gold. That is not some magical decree that just happens. You know, the government does, doesn't just say, this is how it is. And reality is like, okay. I mean, people will test this all the time. The market will effectively test this by uh, selling dollars for gold or redeeming dollars in gold. And uh, dollars get sold all the time and prices still move up and down independent of what you say that the dollar's worth. So that is one of the reasons why in the 30s, the US confiscated dollars and then revalued them because the US was basically going through a liquidity crisis in the Great Depression. But under a gold standard, your liquidity is tied to gold. If you can't find more gold, you can't find more money. If you really need more money, that is a problem. So if you confiscate all the gold, and then devalue it by uh, whatever number you want. I think it was like 70% or 40%, whatever. That effectively gives you 40% more money instantly mm -hmm. because you basically peg it higher. Now, if you look at how this works, you have the dollar here and the gold here. If people start selling the dollar, then the uh, value, well, we can say it goes down. But you want this line to be exactly this. So the value goes down. Now, there's only one way to keep this value from dropping, and that is you need to buy dollars. If the central bank buys dollars, it can destroy dollars. That means that there's less dollars in the market at the same supply of gold, and that means that the dollar becomes more valuable than gold. And the line starts going up again. Now, how does the central bank do this outside of foreign uh, currency? Well, you do that with gold. So effectively, when the dollar goes down, you sell more gold into the market and you buy more dollars back, and that is how you keep the peg. But if the opposite happens, if the dollar becomes worth more than gold, then you still need to do something about that because continuous deflation isn't good either. So how do you do that? Well, you start buying gold out of the market and you start printing dollars and it equalizes again. So when the Russian central bank says that they're going to buy gold at 5,000 rubles per gram, which they will print in order to do this, then they're effectively devaluing the ruble. They're not mm -hmm. pegging it with gold. They're actively devaluing their own currency 
because whenever it gets too valuable, they just print more and they use it to buy gold. Now, this might be a complete mystery to most people. Like, why the hell would they do this when when they announced that the ruble was far less valuable than the dollar? It had just fallen a bit, it's quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. They announced this and now it's suddenly a lot more valuable to the point where they at some point said, oh, we're not going to do it at 5,000 per gram, which caused more misinformation. Everybody was like, oh, they stopped. No, the same message said, we are now going to do it at a negotiated price. Mm -hmm. And uh, that negotiated price is published every day on their key indicators website, uh, cbr.ru slash key dash indicators um and currently it's at 4312.32 rubles per gram so it's gone up it's gone higher than 5000 because now they're buying more gold with less rubles mm -hmm. if it ha if the number was higher than 5000 they would have to spend more rubles to get the same amount of gold but now right. they're spending less rubles to get the same amount of gold and so why did the value of their currency go up? Was it the natural gas trade where they said you have to buy natural gas and rubles? So that increased demand for ruble? Yes. So now that we've got ruble gas um, and companies, uh, countries are forced to buy rubles in order to uh, trade for gas. And even if they do it via Gazprom bank and they give them euros and they buy rubles, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They will still extract rubles from the market in order to put euros into that market. So the supply and demand uh, goes sideways and the euro devalues and the ruble increases in value. So um, aside from that, which, which is capital controls, I'm not saying that the Russians aren't heavily basically manipulating the currency via capital controls, but this mm -hmm. is also war. That is what you do in a war. We are crazy that we're not doing the same. So the plan worked so well, and that's why they had to abandon the limit, because you're effectively now working with multiple currency pairs, and this is where it gets difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. You can't just think in dollars and euros or dollars and rubles. You have to think in gold at the same time. So when the ruble appreciated far above the price that they set, effectively you could buy gold in America and sell it to the Russians, or buy it cheap in America and sell it to the Russians for a massive, massive arbitrage premium. Now, the whole world works on arbitrage, and that is their plan, to arbitrage gold into their vaults. And I'll get to that in a moment. But you and I know that if you do something too obviously, you're going to get a reaction to it. So if the U.S. suddenly sees its gold exports to Russia spike like crazy in the first month of the war, everyone's going to say, hang on, we are sending our gold to the Russians? What the fuck? Obviously, they can't let that happen. So what they've done is they are negotiating the rates where last time I checked, and I calculated this, I think, two or three days ago, um because the ruble because the euro had crashed against the ruble the price measure of gold measured in rubles was lower than the price measured in of gold in euros so you could okay. effectively buy gold cheap in russia ship it to europe sell it cheaper or sell it more expensive i mean and make a profit on the spread the reason why that is, isn't happening, because it's a one-way peg. That is the genius of it. It's not a hard peg. It's a soft peg. Because every gold peg uh, consists of a ceiling and a floor. And they've only instituted the ceiling. They've not instituted the floor. That's mm -hmm. what's confusing everyone. So at, at the price of a few days ago, they, they could have you could have bought gold in Russia for cheaper and sell it, sold it more expensive in Europe, except that you can't export gold from Russia. However, the price of gold in dollars was more expensive than the price of gold in rubles, keeping the current uh, Forex rate in mind. So you could buy gold in America and sell it to the Russian Central Bank at a profit. And the rubles that you get, well, the Europeans need them a lot now anyway. So it's mm -hmm. not like they don't have any value. The beauty of that is 
and that's the genius behind instituting a soft peg in the ceiling, is that in they're killing two birds with one stone here. And this is the part which your viewers will like, or maybe not. Effectively, they're collapsing the COMEX gold scam by forcing exports of gold from America into Russia through simple uh -huh. arbitrage because it, it, you can make money on the spread. And if you can make money on the spread, then people will do it. And thanks to now having a dynamic ceiling, they can basically tune it to the point where you don't really notice, where uh -huh. they don't pull in too much, but they will pull in a little. And this means that while they're siphoning off gold from America, America will, well, with less and less gold, the dollar becomes less and less valuable, and Americans will have less and less gold to buy because it's, you know, it's going east. Yeah, it's, it's essentially what's happening is the, the commodities markets are regionalizing, mm. and by Russia doing this and pulling gold out, it does drain. I mean, it's either going to have to come from London or it's going to have to come from the U.S., and so they're going to, it's going to drain inventories. Yeah. And it's almost like the last stage of the accumulation of gold for both Russia and China because they've been accumulating for a long time, hiding in their sovereign wealth funds and not reporting it. And it's almost like they're calling the bluff of the of the Western market saying, how much do you actually have? Mm -hmm. A lot of people have talked about what are the real numbers because the accounting and the audit's horrible. We don't know. And so it's almost I, like it's pulling, it's pulling on that string to see if the whole thing unravels. Yeah. So the best numbers I can give, um, Alice Dermer Cloud has sources that say that Russia has approximately 12,000 tons of gold, which would be mm -hmm. more than America's 8,000 tons. I right. did some calculations. You know what the floor is that they can defend the ruble at if they have 12,000 tons of gold? What would it be? 5,500 rubles per gram. Mm. That is shockingly close to their ceiling, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but even at... Uh, I already did the calculations. If you just take the US M2 and you divide it by the 8,000 tons of gold that the central bank says they have, and you take the same thing with Russian M2 and you look at how much gold they officially have, let's uh, 2,200 tons, I believe. Then um, if we go to a gold backed ruble, the ruble would lose about two thirds of its value, drop 67%. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the U.S. dollar drops 97%. Mm -hmm. And I also posted in a tweet thread that currently the ruble is absolutely no threat to the dollar as a global reserve currency. Or, well, not as a global reserve currency. I'm not really sure we're going to get a new one for a while. I think we're just going to get a lot of regional currencies. And it'll be yeah, I agree with that. Slice competing currencies. Like, yeah, 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 like 10% ruble, like 15% yuan, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, currently, the dollar has just a huge share. Well, if you measure it in gold, and then uh, the currencies depreciate against gold via the M2 versus gold in the central bank vaults, then effectively... The amount of liquidity that you need on the markets to settle a trade in rubles versus dollars, currently it's like 40 times as big, but mm -hmm. after the revaluing, it would only be like three times as big. And liquidity is all that matters. Money stock does not matter. All that matters is how easily can you get the stuff, uh, how many people will take it. If it's right. a gold-backed ruble, everyone will take it. And how easy is it to get the stuff? Well, if you only need triple the liquidity in rubles versus dollars, then it's only like three times as hard to get rubles versus dollars. So the share of rubles versus dollars in global trade will rise because mm -hmm. it might might still be low, but it's not nearly as low as it is now. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Peter Lynch says, you can make money on the stock when it goes from terrible to bad, from bad to mediocre, from mediocre to good, and from good to great. So that is why they're doing it. I mean, sure, uh, it's going to have negative effects, but objectively speaking, from the Russian point of view, it can't get much worse. Like the current situation that they're in, they're locked out of the current fiat system. The mm -hmm. owner of the current fiat system, the U.S., is highly belligerent towards them. 
they're, they're, they're almost being turned into a new North Korea by the West. So what what do they have to lose? Yeah, I got that's, nothing to lose. And their yeah, partner that's... in China is probably what's going to end up saving them because China is a conduit to that Belt and Road Initiative and, and other, you know, the trading district that they built. So I mm-hmm. think, I honestly think with Russia's resources and, and that connection, China really holds key to Russia's future. China has a lot of power over Russia right now. But as long as China remains allies with Russia, I don't think the West can crush Russia. Well, here's the thing. China and Russia aren't really allies. They're more allies of opportunity because we forced them to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, I think even Henry Kishin, Kissinger was warning about this line of geopolitical thinking back in the 70s that we mm-hmm. should not uh, thrust Russia into China's arms and vice versa. And that's exactly what the U.S. has done. Exactly so what we did, yeah. That was stupid. But... China and Russia aren't allies because geopolitically speaking, what they need is different. China is a big importer. They don't have many raw resources themselves, not anymore in any case. So uh, a commodity currency would hurt China because they would basically start exporting their gold en masse if they have a gold-backed currency. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, you know, their property sector is collapsing, their tech sector is collapsing. They're, they're not in a good shape. So in, that's why China has been so on the fence about the whole thing. On the one hand, they are investing in Russia. On the other hand, they are uh, pulling out of Russia. But they're also pulling out of the West, which everybody yep. seems to overlook. China is China's going from a, an export-driven economy to they want to be a consumer-led economy like the U.S. was. But like you said, they need resources. And, and, but the way that they do it is different. They don't use the war machine like the, like the, the West does. They use trade and so they're in africa and trading with all these nations to try to develop their economy um and and i think that their approach is going to be smart in the long run it's going to be cheaper for china to do what they're doing using trade alliances to get what they want rather than taking the imperialist route it'd just be interesting to see whether china ever flips and goes more imperialist or if they're just going to stick with their trade plan i think china's going to go more authoritarian well, totalitarian, actually, mm-hmm. um, because China is not healthy at all. Uh, their financial, you know, expansion into Africa that that has given them access to a lot of resources, but that doesn't mean any of the debt has been spent productively. They've already yeah, cut there's their... a lot of there's a lot of yuan based debt out there, so that puts their yuan in danger. I think uh, they cut their. Um... God, what was what? Good... Forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh yeah, reserve ratio. Their uh, reserve ratio, which unlocks more money to lend for uh, banks, uh, that's like three percent now. They've basically been easing, while everybody mm-hmm. else has been sort of on the way to tightening, which shows you how bad of a position they are in. Mm-hmm. So, honestly, my long-term prediction for China is that it falls apart into war- warring states again. Because that's their long-term culture. Uh, empire united must divide, and an empire divided must unite. They've been united mm-hmm. under the uh, communists for a very long time, but that's under the social contract of uh, continuous growth. If that growth ends because America basically goes bankrupt, communism might not be around to stay. Yeah. Do you think that in the meantime, this leads to more regional wars? So we've got Ukraine. Which is which is a pretty big deal as far as Russia is concerned, as far as the importance of grains and other things that Ukraine supplies, and geopolitically the buffer between the West and NATO. But do you mm-hmm. think China gets involved at some point geopolitically and says um, we need to do things to stabilize ourselves, even becomes maybe more protectionist at some point because China has a history of protectionism. Uh, but, you know, do they go yes. after Taiwan or do they start with the hot wars? No, I don't. Th- well, technically, they already tried to start something with India, like in 2020. Mm-hmm. But um, I think China will try to be a false friend for as long as they can. Mm-hmm. So they're on the one hand, they will uh, advocate a rules-based international order. But on the other hand, they've got massive amounts of illegal shipping fleets uh, or uh, fishing fleets everywhere. It's a huge problem off the coast of South America, and they don't give a shit. 
mm-hmm. the point where the Jap- I, I think the Japanese started blowing them up. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't really, yeah, China says one thing, it does another, but mm-hmm. they're not stupid. Uh, they may be isolated, they may be divorced from reality, but that doesn't specifically make them stupid. That's, for mm-hmm. instance, they stockpiled a lot of commodities over the past two years, uh, a lot of food. That was definitely not a stupid thing to do. Although, you know, the long-term uh, projects that they've engaged in that have all gone nowhere, that was stupid. But the whole idea of we have to do this because of this, well, that isn't stupid. China knows what's up. China knows that it's the resources on this planet are just dwindling at the rate mm-hmm. that we're using them now. As supply chains have been stretched to the max. So, yeah. I think China will not start regional wars until they have to or until they can. And the difference between is in one situation, if they run out of coal, for instance, and Australia is not willing to export them their coal because Australia now has China in the bind for once, then China will just invade Australia because they Mm -hmm. have to. Uh, But the other part is if America now goes into a true hyperinflationary collapse, and we're talking about uh, in two years, the defense budget is effectively halved because, you know, you can't afford to uh, anymore. Then China will attack Taiwan because if in such a situation, America tries to defend Taiwan, all it does is destroy its own currency faster. Which yeah, it won't, be able, it won't be able to. The U.S. is living on borrowed time, so that the military superiority is based upon the currency. And that's, I think, what people miss in terms of what the U.S. has done with its military. The military can only be supported as long as you have, as you can pay for it. Same thing that happened to Rome. It fell apart because it couldn't pay their soldiers. Uh, so same thing probably would happen to the U.S. And, and yeah, if, if, if China did attack Taiwan or, or Australia, it would bankrupt America, but probably a lot of the rest of the West as well, mm. trying to well, defend it. Because because if they attack if they attack Australia, the entire NATO is going to get involved. I would imagine. Yeah, if NATO can afford it. Exactly, because so, who pays for NATO? It's the United States. I, I said a lot on Twitter uh, in the past, and I should say it more often that uh, armies march on their stomachs, but war wars are run on their finances. If you can't afford to go to war, uh, there is no war. And that that is very extreme. That even counts for stuff like Nazi Germany. So Mm -hmm. if uh, America can't afford to defend Taiwan, America shouldn't try. Because if America tries, you immediately go bankrupt. That's just how it's going to be. Yeah. Um, And China will attack or try to conquer Taiwan via some means or another at some point. Uh, simply because they need the strategic semiconductor industry that Taiwan has. Mm. Um, With that, they effectively have a um, 10-year advantage on the U.S. because Intel fucked up their uh, process, their new 10 nanometer process or whatever it was that took years to develop. It was far too ambitious, and now they're just behind. But the Mm -hmm. Chinese, mainland China, is just as far behind. They can create semiconductors, produce a lot of the entire supply chains there, but it's all kind of low level stuff. Mm -hmm. All the high level stuff, the Nvidia stuff, the Apple stuff, the Intel stuff, the the AMD stuff, the stuff you want to buy, that is produced in Taiwan, in TSMC. So they need it. It's just purely strategically and politically because for Xi, it would be a, a huge victory to finally quote unquote reunite china whether that is or isn't true doesn't matter it's politically seen that way and his position is not as secure as it looks the Mm. third conference whatever it's coming up he's coming up for a third term he needs to survive the conference in september after Mm -hmm. that he is pretty secure for another five years in his leadership who are you speaking about specifically oh uh, the president of china uh xi Xi jinping yeah xi jinping Mm -hmm. If you just swallow afterwards, it sounds Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's Winnie the Pooh. That's easier to refer to. Anyway. Mm-hmm. China will, he will do whatever he needs to secure his leadership. And uh, honestly, I don't know what they're doing with the cur- current uh, COVID lockdowns. 
uh, which is happening in Shanghai. And I think like another 70 million or half of China's on the lockdown. Uh, Beijing will, almost went through panic because they thought uh, it's going to get more strict there soon. Cause like they found like 40 cases, all asymptomatic. Eight, so zero COVID doesn't work, but they might try and keep it up just so that C can say that he fought it tooth and nail. And then they're right. going to let it go in the next September. But uh, yeah, Ooh. hyperinflation messes things up. So I, I said like two years ago already that I thought that we're going to get a war between America and the U.S. or uh, American U.S., America and China, and the decider would be hyperinflation. If hyperinflation came before America or China attacked Taiwan or something like that, um, there wouldn't be a war between China and America because neither could afford it. But if hyperinflation took too long because of a need for a greater enemy, eventually China was going to pull some shit or America was going to pull mm -hmm. some shit because you both needed uh, a big external enemy. Well, I was wrong about America pulling shit on China. Instead, you pulled shit on Russia. Mm -hmm. That came out of the blue. Well, yeah, attack a commodity exporter while you're uh, a big importer yourself. That, that no, uh, bold strategy, Cotton. We'll see how that works out for you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's an intelligent strategy. I think there are things behind the scenes to why they want to, that to occur. I think the, the, the Western powers are trying to draw a fence around their com competition because I think they know the currency is dying. They th I think they know it's a multipolar world. And now fences are being drawn around properties, if you will, geopolitical properties on who's going to ally with who in the, in the coming conflicts. Oh, and sure. I think Russia sees that and they, they don't want – they didn't want Ukraine to become part of NATO because that removed the buffer, not only from the U.S., but the Western powers on its border. And from China's perspective, it's, it's all about, like you said, it's all about resources and, and about them flipping to their own consumer-led economy, which is what they want, but they're having trouble getting there. Anyway, it's a fascinating discussion. There, there's so many moving parts to it, uh, Karen. I think it's going to be worthwhile following. We're probably going to get more surprises along the way that, that neither of us see. Mm, uh, well, but that's, be that's because nothing's static. That's because somebody does something and then somebody does something else, right? Uh, Lloyd has already uh, reported that uh, ruble gold is officially under discussion uh, by the Kremlin. So uh, we are closer than ever. I'm still mm -hmm. at a 90% chance that it happens. There might still come something out of the blue that derails the whole plan. Yeah. But the market is positioning for it. It's not just the ruble. It's the yen. That also started falling uh, around the point that the ruble started appreciating again. Mm -hmm. So um, if one thing that was no most notable to me in the whole process was the uh, Russian space agency who said that they were now going to require everyone to pay in rubles. And why would you start demanding rubles for contracts if you expect it to fall in value. Mm -hmm. Now, I I understand that like the, the Russian space agency is effectively a state agency, so they can, but no other state uh, agency did. Mm -hmm. You know, w w it, it, it completely came out of the blue. Like they have in international dealings that are now winding down, but they still have them. So it's it's also such a minor sector compared to like oil or gas. It's just a few engines, basically. So why would they do that? To me, it just indicates a larger plan at foot that uh, this whole process of not dollarizing, but de-dollarizing, if you will, and rubling, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's much more like much more likely to happen if everyone is switching to rubles instead of saying, you know what, we want more dollars. If, if it was the reverse, if uh, the space agency didn't think that uh, it would be a good idea, then we would have heard some opposition to this. I've seen Russian commentators uh, oppose the war. Uh, also, commentators said they aren't doing enough, but I've seen no comments against this entire commodity financial business mainly because I think the Russians are winning.
If you yeah. look at the yen in gold or the euro in gold and compare that to ruble in gold, you can see why. That's another thing a lot of people have missed. I mean, people have been saying, well, the ruble's appreciating against the euro and the dollar. Yes, but if you look at the ruble against its price in gold, that is also pre-war mm -hmm. and, and getting better. Slowly but surely. Yeah. So if the yen is losing its value in gold and the euro is losing its value in gold, but the ruble is holding its value in gold, I don't want to be holding euros. I would be want I want to hold rubles. That's right, because gold is the ultimate financial asset in the system. The central banks know it even though they, they say it's not. Gold is always what you revalue currency to. And what you're seeing is Russia trying to revalue its currency against the basket of others. And mm -hmm. how are they doing it? They're doing it via gold. And via Bitcoin or central bank digital currency, they do it via gold. And that's always been the case and probably always will be. I mean, something eventually will replace gold, but it's going to be the case for a long time. Gold is going to be central to, to what goes on in the currency markets. Well, I've done my best to develop a system that might replace gold by making a digital value, the very mm -hmm. first actual digital value that has been described. And mm -hmm. even my system has limitations. So, uh, no, for a long time going forward, Gold will be the ultimate measure of value as for currencies at the very least. And mm -hmm. yeah, if your currency isn't sound in measurement of value against gold, then it's, it's going to revalue. And I still yeah. think we're going to get a great revaluing, which is different from the great reset. It's mm -hmm. more like the great revaluing happens instantly. It, it probably happens after gold already starts to slide in dollars. And we, we see it go to like 2,500 and 3,000. And maybe a little bit above. And then suddenly we get a banking holiday because everybody's like, well, this can't continue. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a week passes by and they're announcing we're having another week worth of banking holiday. And everybody thinks, what the hell? What, what's going on? And then after the banks finally open, you get the real valuation of uh, gold. It's like eighty or $20,000 per ounce or $80,000 per ounce. Because again, mm -hmm. you divide M2 by the tonnage that they have you come to $85,000 per ounce. So it could very well be that one day we just opened there. And at that point, everyone who wasn't in just lost. But everybody who stays out because they think they lost, then get hit by the great reset, which comes next. Because at that point, everyone's gonna ask, okay, how much gold is there really out there? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then everybody because, has to show their cards at the poker table, right? Yeah. Or be so kicked out of the poker game. You can you can uh, see the uh, the great revaluation as the river, like the turn of the last card. At that point, mm -hmm. everybody knows what's up, and the great mm -hmm. reset is everybody showing their cards, and the chips get divided where they land, mm -hmm. effectively. All right, Karen, it's great having you on the program. We'll have you back. Uh, I think uh, we've done about 40, 40 minutes here. We'll have you back as as things progress. Uh, how do people ah, find you? On, we missed the subject. Twitter? We missed the subject. T -doc. Oh, we did. Ah, can what we still we talk missed? about that? Sure. Uh, Teladoc Health being cut in half and Ark and Kathy Wood. Let, let's do a separate segment on that. Because the the reason I say that, that there's another discussion in terms of valuation of the stock market and stuff, and that probably is 30 minutes. All right. Well, then we're going to do an outro with... Uh... Do you want to guys? Do you guys want to see a third part? And if they say yes, we'll come back and talk about Ark. <laughs> yeah, let's do a third part. All right. Okay. So, Karen, thanks for thanks for your your work on Russia, gold, the ruble, other currencies, the Great Revaluation, revaluation reset. We also had part one had to do with the mortgage backed securities market. We got more to talk about. We got more to talk about, Kathy. Was mm -hmm. an arc and and that whole mess, but I think that discussion needs to be separated because it really is going to lead to a bigger discussion on the stock market as well and how the stock market is valued uh, because it's indicative basically of a lot of the crap that goes on. So we'll just leave it there. Thanks, Karen, for joining us. How do people reach out to you if they want to follow you on Twitter, Substack, uh, Twitch? Uh, God, I wish I could make shorter discussions, but there's just so much going on these days. Mm -hmm. So you can find me on Twitter, where I'm most active, uh, where I go by the handle of Deso Games. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find me on uh, desogames.substack.com, where I write articles from time to time. Uh, I should write a new article, but I haven't been in the mood. I, most of the long things that I found just turn into long uh, threads on Twitter. 
So mm-hmm. again, that's where I'm most active. Uh, I've got my own website, desertgames.com, that's uh, horribly um, out of maintenance. And most actively, I'm also on Twitch, where I stream twice a week. So twitch.tv slash desertgames, where uh, Thursdays and Saturdays, uh, you can ask me questions and we just go through the markets and such. Cool. All right. Thanks, Karian. And uh, thanks for having me. Bye.